There was a group of people called the Essenes. They lived in Christ's time, and they are most interesting. And here to talk about the Essenes, and by the way, they, they had a calendar, and we're going to talk uh, with the author of this book, Ken Johnson. And you've seen Ken before. He's been here many times, always writes on fascinating subjects that nobody else touches. Ken, welcome to Prophecy Watchers. Thanks for having me back. The Essenes, uh, I think we've all thought about them, maybe National Geographic, we would talk about uh, some of the uh, ancient archaeological digs and Qumran, and I think everybody's sort of heard about the Essenes, maybe a little bit, mm -hmm. but I think to most people they are a mystery. They're sort of hidden away. Yeah, it's, it's amazing though, because when you go back and you look at the scrolls, they tell you everything about themselves, where they came from, uh, the apostasy that hid in the first age. So it's really amazing to study, and their calendar is uh, actually points to certain prophecies we were unaware of. Now, they were a very godly and devoted people. Yes. And in past conversations with you, I've gotten the impression that the Essenes were kind of anti-pharisaical. Definitely. And tell us a little about that, the culture. Well, what had happened was back around uh, 170 B.C. or so, during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, the Zadok priests, which are the ones that are supposed to be running the temple or running it in a godly fashion, were ousted by this new group, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They went to Qumran, took the temple scrolls with them, and became known as the Essenes. The Essenes are followers of the Zadok priest doctrine, even though they can't go to Qumran because they're not priests. So people tend to get that confused, but it's basically the Zadok priests now, the fascinating thing, and we usually forget about it, but if you read the New Testament, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in particular, and you read about the run-ins that Jesus and the disciples had with the, with the priesthood mm -hmm. then in power, it all fits together. It makes perfect sense because the priesthood did not at all favor uh, a godly approach to life. They were sort of political, right? Right. The Sadducees were political, just do what the government says. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees uh, believed in life everlasting and wanted to please God, but they deliberately changed things. And the Zadok priests were saying you can't change things. The Zadok priests taught that there would be one Messiah with two comings. The Messiah would come and die for our sins. They even gave the date at 32 AD. And the, all these prophecies would be fulfilled. But the Pharisees said no, Messiah is not God incarnate. There is no virgin birth. He didn't come in 32 AD. So they changed everything. And the, the Zadok priests said the Pharisees were apostate. They called them the sons of darkness. Mm -hmm. Now, how did they know? I mean, it, what, what would give them their clue when they said uh, he would come in 32 AD? Uh, there's a specific scroll, the Melchizedek document, that gives all the date details for that. But basically, they had the writings of the patriarchs from way back when. And if you believe the patriarchs, that's Adam through Aaron, they basically tell you, this is how you interpret prophecy. But then the Pharisees come along and said, no, that stuff is fake. We have the oral Torah, which is the secret stuff that Moses told us. And the Essenes said, no, that stuff is fake. So you've got two different doctrines. But as a Christian, I'm going to follow what the New Testament tells me. And the New Testament uh, agrees completely with what the Zadok priest said and completely goes against what the Pharisees said. And that brings us to the book, The Ancient Dead Sea Scroll Calendar. Uh, and it, it, you're uh, postulating that this is, quote unquote, the real thing. This is the real calendar. Mm -hmm. It's definitely the Essene calendar. It's the Essene calendar. Mm -hmm. And it has a long history, goes back uh, into history, and you cover that, mm -hmm. uh, all the way back to really the beginning of Scripture. Mm -hmm. and. By the way, and before we go any, any further, uh, probably most people have noticed there's a, a, a little round thing on the uh, table in front of you which shows up, you know, and, and uh, when you read this book, that little round thing is right on the cover and it, it has a lot to do with the Essenes. Really amazing. Yeah, this is a uh, replica of a uh, sundial found in Qumran 
and it tells us uh, how they do the calendar. Basically, it starts in the spring at the, at the equinox, the spring equinox, and then you have the 12 months, each mm -hmm. season divided by what they call a tekufa, or a solstice or an equinox, and it's a 364-day calendar where everything comes out in even weeks. So like Passover is always on Tuesday, the 14th of Nisan. And that helps immensely when you go through the Gospels and the Epistles, when they tell you something happened two days after this, you know exactly when it was, and all of a sudden prophecies and other things pop out at you. Hmm. So name one uh, that really gets your attention, for example. Um, as far as that stuff goes, uh, one that I thought was really amazing is that the, the Essenes teach that there are four festivals that the um, uh, Pharisees didn't teach on, and they're specifically for the Age of Grace or the Church Age. And they all fall on Sundays. It's the festivals of first fruits of the barley, Pentecost, new wine, and new oil. And what's interesting is all these fall on Sundays, and everybody tries to say, well, the Jews just followed a Saturday Sabbath, but they also had Sunday festivals. One thing is in Matthew 24 and 25, Jesus is talking about the end times to mm -hmm. his disciples. And when you get to chapter 26, it says that when he'd finished this, he said to his disciples, you know that the Passover is in two days, which would be Tuesday, the 14th right. of Nisan, which means he gave this sermon to them privately on Sunday. And you see that as a pattern all the way through the scrolls and through the church ages. Uh, the church didn't change from Saturday to Sunday. Jesus didn't even change it from Saturday to Sunday. It's always been that way. And that was hidden de uh, deliberately by the Pharisees. There's so, a lot of other mysteries in there. Uh, so where does the Sabbath fit here, uh, the, the, uh, the, the day before Sunday? Uh, the Sabbath was something that was instituted by the law of Moses for the Jews. And it's extremely important. It's always been also. Right. We see it back at creation. And it's very important. It's set aside because the calendar can't be done properly unless you have the same seven-day cycle. Now, as Gentiles, we don't need to do anything, any sacrifices or anything. But when you mix up the Sabbath or mix up Sundays or mix up uh, new moon phases in the calendar, you get off. And that was actually a prophecy that the Essenes gave, that the Jews at a certain point would apostatize and part of that would be to go to a lunar calendar system. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, when you have a solar calendar, uh, and theirs is a 364-day three, uh, calendar, right. uh, do they have a leap year, and how do they take care of that? Yeah, there's a leap year once every uh, five to six years. The way that it works on the Gregorian calendar that we use there's one day added every four years, mm -hmm. and that keeps us even. Right. On a modern Jewish calendar, they use an entire month every three years. So their calendar gets way off before they fix right. it. The Essene calendar has a leap week. So it gets up to three days off, you add a week to it, and it's three days ahead, and then it comes back. So the first of the year, it always is within three days of the spring equinox, which on the Gregorian calendar is March 20th. So it's really interesting. It's very fascinating. It's very, very accurate. And it keeps the seven-day cycle in, in tune, so just like it should be. Now, what I like about this book is, and by the way, let's not get numbers crazy here. I, you may be just like I am. Uh, too many numbers, and I just say, oh, I'm losing interest. But it's not about numbers. It's about worship mm -hmm. and a history of worship. And that's what really lights me up about this book because you, you go back into history and, and you bring out uh, aspects of worship that I had never even thought about. Uh, and, and that's the beauty of studying the Essenes to me. Yeah, the whole idea that their, their time at the end of their age, the Pharisees had apostatized and they called them the sons of darkness and themselves mm -hmm. the sons of light because of the use of the calendar. Not that that in itself was important. Unless, of course, you are a priest. You know, if you do the Yom Kippur ritual wrong, you die. Well, if you did it yeah. absolutely perfectly, but on the wrong day, it's still wrong, and you die. So the calendar is very important to them. Life and death. Yeah, life and death. Wow. But the fact that it was prophesied and it was part of something that points to the festivals. We all know that Paul talks about Jesus' death as the Passover lamb. We all know the fall festivals point to the second coming. The summer festivals point to the age of grace, things that they were trying to deliberately hide from us. 
And it's important because it all focuses on prophecy. Hmm. And the fascinating thing, again, to me, is to know that there was a godly remnant in mm-hmm. the days of Jesus. Because if you read the Bible, you find out, find out about apostasy and hyperlegalism and politics with the Pharisees and Sadducees and, and, and cozying up with the Roman government and uh, it, it, all sorts of problems. Paul you know, it got in trouble, mm-hmm. as we all remember. You know, he, he came back from his missionary journey and, and uh, essentially he was arrested on the steps there of the, of the, uh, uh, of the Roman uh, emplacement at the, uh, at the uh, uh, one end of the Temple Mount. And uh, when, when Paul was arrested, it's almost kind of funny, he, he spoke in Latin to the guard and said, I just happen to be a Roman citizen, so take your hands off me. <clears throat> but Paul was talking in terms of the reality of the Messiah. And these people were not at all willing to hear that. And when I read your book, it gives me a little insight into why. Mm-hmm. Because there was a real division in the way they looked at life. Yeah, when Paul in, in Hebrews talks, he's trying to explain Melchizedek, he doesn't go any further because he says you're dull of hearing. It doesn't right. mean that they were stupid. It's because if he would have started to explain it, they would have said, ah, oh, that's sad. that's a scene doctrine. We all know about it. It's heresy. We don't care. They'd already set their minds against the concept of Messiah. And so the argument there on the steps of the fortress of Antonia uh, just gives us a little insight into the uh, cultures of the day, the cultural clashes. And that's what I've always thought when I read about the Essenes. And then they sort of disappeared Mm -hmm. to nobody knows where. They're kind of a mystery people. And I've always sort of dropped it at that and until <laughs> Ken comes along and writes books about them. And you, you make them come alive as a people, which I just think is great. Yeah, the remnant uh, were awaiting Messiah. They taught that Messiah would come and die for their sins in 32 AD. The very next Pentecost would be the time that we can enter into the covenant of grace. Hmm. So they're waiting for this, and it happens when it was prophesied to take place. And all of a sudden we see in Acts thousands of people accept the Lord on that first day. Many of them were priests from the Essene, the Zadok class. And it's amazing that they wanted to be, they were awaiting this stuff. So naturally they would disappear. They became us, went out and evangelized the world. You know, there's an ancient Jewish uh, tradition uh, on the eve of Pentecost uh, called Decorating the Bride where they stay up all night and they pray and they read uh, a, a special uh, parshas that is sections of scripture and there's a tradition among the Jews up to this day that uh, at some point uh, in the middle of the night the heavens will open for a split second and if you happen to be praying uh, and happen to be uh, your heart is just right what you are seeing at that moment will be received by God. In other words a tiny little opening of the heavens on on the night of Pentecost of course you stay up all night and welcome the sunrise the next morning and the the Jews call that decorating the bride and it's fascinating we have that in Acts chapter 2 we have the disciples staying up all night and to sunrise the next day and they go out and glorify God in the streets and uh, all these things fit together in a beautiful way and I'm sure there were some Essenes there. Oh yeah, as a matter of fact the the Essene scrolls talk about that the fact that when Messiah comes to start the Age of Grace we would have a different covenant, a different priesthood and there would be the bride of the Messiah. Let's talk about the calendar. Now I I don't have this book open to the calendar and if I did I, I certainly wouldn't try to translate it for you. But you've got calendars in this book uh, in two or three places. And uh, tell us about uh, the meaning of the calendar from an Essene point of view. Well, the Essenes taught that there was the seven days of creation. The sun, moon, and stars were created on the fourth day. So that's Wednesday, the fourth day of their week. And that's when the calendar starts. It's the Wednesday closest to the spring equinox. Hmm. And so at that point it starts and 14 days later, later is Passover, which is always on a Tuesday. And then it goes all the way down to the end of the year. 
the, the basic calendar has 12 months of 30 days apiece, so that's a 360 day year, but then the solstices and the equinoxes are added, they're outside the months, so there's four extra days for the two solstices, two equinoxes, that's a 364 day calendar, which is how all the weeks are set evenly. Uh-huh. And then you can actually go back uh, through multiple ways and figure out the year. So the calendar system is actually pretty specific because we this is 2020 AD and it's 57 something on the Jewish calendar. Well, it's 5945 on the Essene calendar, mm-hmm. much closer to where we, the kingdom age would be than the Jewish calendar has it. Now, to you, as I gather, and I'm going to ask you the question, do you think that the Essene calendar is quote unquote more accurate? Uh, Yeah, it definitely seems to be because when you go through the scriptures, even like back in the Old Testament where Moses came down from the mountain and then God said two days later do this or five days later do that, you figure out what that is. And on the Essene calendar, it always comes up to a festival or something that they're doing. The modern Jewish calendar, there isn't anything. As a matter of fact, in Daniel, when it says, blessed are you if you make it to the 1335 in Daniel chapter 12, we all know that that's from a festival to a festival, but it flat does not fit on the modern Jewish calendar. Hmm. On the Essene calendar, it does, and the mystery is finally solved. Wow, that's really interesting. And, and again, uh, Ken sort of approaches uh, historical study from an entirely different uh, uh, angle th- than I think most other scholars do. Have you gotten in trouble with, with other people? Uh, do they, they say you have no right to, to write this stuff, that we don't believe that at all? Have, have you uh, encountered any resistance? You could say that a little bit. <laughs> well, but it's kind of a new way of looking at things, mm-hmm. but not new at all if you really go back and, and look at the uh, the records. Yeah, one of the things that I do get in trouble with is because there's a lot of people that love the Lord that want to follow the Jewish festivals and they're following the modern Jewish calendar, which is lunar. If the Dead Sea Scrolls are correct, that is a corruption. Actually, it's a pagan system that incorporated with the Essene, with the Pharisees, rather. And so we should be following the original solar calendar that God gave us. Otherwise, as the prophecy said, you'll end up having the festivals on the wrong days and everything will get garbled. So again... We're not necessarily saying we can prove this is the original calendar, but it's the Essene calendar, and that's what the Essenes taught. Hmm. And so uh, they, they talked about a solar calendar. Uh, let's go back again to the sundial, uh, because you spend quite a bit of time talking about the sundial. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk about how we can gain uh, a little knowledge, biblical knowledge, from looking at that sundial. How, how does it work? Because well, I'm sure people are looking at it and they're saying, I don't understand that at all. It doesn't have numbers on it. Uh, you know, it's mm-hmm. uh, how would you tell what time it is or what, what do you use it for? Well, basically the way this is, is you, you set it up and this, this particular model was found in Qumran at the entrance. So we know it was functioning at the time it was uh, 2,000 years ago. But there are, since, uh, there are lines or circles on this uh-huh. that mark the months. So as the, um, the uh, months go by, the, the shadow from the center pole gets longer and longer until the summer solstice, then it gets shorter. And there's markings on here to mark which ones are the equinoxes. Now, I, I see an outer ring with marks on it and then an inner ring with marks on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, are, what are those, what is the difference? Uh, the, the outer ring has 52 marks, and as you can guess, 52 is the number of uh, weeks in a weeks year. Weeks in a year. This, the center one, or the smaller one, has 30 marks, and as you can guess, that would be the 30 days per month. And so there's 30 days per month, and then there's a tekufa, and then there's after, after three of them. And so this actually allows you to figure out uh, what week you are in on the calendar. Yeah, it's 52 weeks. 52 weeks is 52 weeks, folks. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, that's, that's amazing. But how do you know for sure that, um, or what they were doing, or how they were using that thing? Because, like I say, it doesn't have any numbers on it and so forth. You had... It was a mystery for a while. The main mystery was exactly how you do the, uh, the uh, leap year. Uh, but the rest of the stuff was actually given to us in uh, uh, Josephus. Josephus uh, explains how they used the menorah in the temple to figure out the leap week and how this works. So thank you, Josephus. But then there's also documents in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Book of Enoch, Jubilees, and a few others, 
that describe the uh, six uh, signs that you use to figure out where you're at on the calendar. And so between all of those scrolls together, it comes out really well. And there were uh, probably close to 200 fragments, and the University of Tel Aviv finally managed to put all those together last year. And it was really interesting to me when they said, we came up with a new word, takufa. It has dropped out of Hebrew, and nobody knew what it meant, but it's a solstice or an equinox. And so all that stuff is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the word again is? Takufa. Takufa. And it talks about solstice. Solstices and equinoxes. Okay. The markings of the four right. seasons since and they're we, outside the months. We know what the sol- summer solstice is. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, modern day America, we, we talk about the solstice. That is the, when the sun reaches its maximum extension in the sky. And then you know from that point on, the days are going to start getting shorter and shorter and so forth. And, uh, but they, the fact that, that, that the Essenes watched this and the fact that they linked their calendar that calendar to scripture is i think it's just amazing yeah it is I, i'm just sitting here open mouthed and, and and when i read the book by the way i <laughs> said wow this changes everything <laughs> it really does if you think about it and then if this is correct it means some of the hebrew roots guys are a little off on things but more importantly there are two festivals that teach prophecy about the age of grace that we need to know about. So it's really interesting to know that there were things that they knew about Messiah that we have forgotten, and things about the first and second comings that we have forgotten. And it all focuses on prophecy. The scrolls say it's a, it's a serious sin to ignore Bible prophecy. I always thought that was amazing. Hmm. And they were actually looking for the coming mm-hmm. uh, of the Messiah. Well, if they were properly keeping the calendar... Uh, this this group of Jews actually might have been expecting the Lord. Mm-hmm. And you can get the 32 AD figure from Daniel chapter 9. I don't know if they got it from there or not because they were known to be prophets, led by prophets. Mm-hmm. And Josephus and many of the other people say that the Essenes were always 100% accurate with their prophecy. They were in tune with the Holy Spirit. The, the Pharisees on the other hand said, oh that stuff is past, that doesn't happen anymore. Ah. Interesting. Well, now when I think of 32 A.D., and, and again, I'm no calendricist. I, I'm, I'm not sure I can e- I'm even allowed to say that word, but I, <laughs> I do remember 32 as the date of the crucifixion. Now, some people say 31, 33, I don't know, but 32 mm-hmm. A.D. Would, would be his crucifixion. Uh, would they have known that? calendrically or would they have calculated that? Yeah because they have their their calendar system all mapped out Uh, their calendar system goes in in the concept of 7,000 years with a millennium millennium at the end so there's 6,000 years of human history the 6,000 years are broken up into three ages of 2,000 years apiece Hmm. each 2,000 years is broken up into five unas each una is uh, 10 jubilee cycles and that's 500 years So in the prophecy, in the Melchizedek document, it says the end of the age is the 10th jubilee of their cycle. And they said that the Messiah would come and and be crucified, well, die for our sins, that that event to reconcile us to God would be one Shemitah after the end of the ninth jubilee at the end of the owner of their age. So if you calculate that back, the end of the age was 75 minus a jubilee, which gets you to 25 A.D., plus a Shemitah, which is a seven-year period. 25 plus 7 is 32. Hmm. So they were expecting, it's on our calendar, 32 mm-hmm. A.D., their calendar, one Shemitah after the ninth wow. Jubilee. Now that's fascinating. I don't expect you to remember all those numbers. And you don't have to. All you have to do is get to the book, uh, the ancient Dead Sea Scroll calendar for your gift of $20, shipping included anywhere in the U.S. By the way, uh, if you go to... Uh, uh, Prophecy Watchers uh, website, you're going to be able to see uh, Ken's name and a whole list of the, of the books that he has written. And you'll profit by this one, I guarantee you, um, because you're going to see a panorama. And that's the way it appeared to me, kind of like a, a whole new uh, cross-section of how to, how to perceive the Bible. Mm-hmm. And, and then 
Uh, you, if you're like me, you're going to puzzle over this little sundial for a while until you figure out what it's trying to say. But it's, believe me, it's worth finding out. Can goes places uh, in scripture and in history that other men just do not go. And I want you to know that it's profitable to, to see what he's done. By the way, as we uh, often do, we put things together in packages. Uh, if you'd like this book plus a, a, a package of related uh, items, we have the Best of Ken Johnson package, which includes, by the way, uh, this DVD, End Times Prophecies of Book of Enoch, uh, in which I interview uh, Ken uh, about those end times prophecy, plus these other books, Ancient Church Fathers, uh, Ancient Prophecies Revealed, another one called uh, Ancient Origins of Modern Holidays, and uh, finally the end times uh, of by the Ancient Church Fathers, I should say. What can I tell you? For a gift of $75, shipping included anywhere in the United States, uh, the best of Ken Johnson package. If you just want the book, uh, you can have that for $20, shipping anywhere in the United States included. And the thing I love about Ken Johnson, and if you haven't been exposed to his way of thinking before, he's, uh, I would call you methodical. Very methodical. Uh, Whereas a lot of us, you know, we go here, we go there, we, hey, this is interesting, I'm going to follow that one for a while. Uh, but you sort of sit there and just find out how things work, which, which I, I, I like, because if you didn't do it, nobody else would. Yeah, when I first started looking at the calendar, I didn't think it would be that interesting. But since the Essenes had all those prophecies and they made it extremely important that we yeah. understand that, it must be important. So yeah. we kept working on it until we figured it out. Again, what would be uh, the single most important thing to be gleaned from this book, the ancient Dead Sea Scroll calendar? Um, the fact that there were Essenes back when that followed the Messiah that have basically Christian doctrine. And our Jewish uh, friends out there really need to stop and think if they want to follow the rabbinical model or look at what the Dead Sea Scrolls are saying. Because it's not Christian at all. We didn't write them. So they wow. need to think about that. And for Christians, I would say the whole fact that there are two more festivals that teach prophecy that we need to know about, that's pretty important. It is important indeed. Well, I hope you've enjoyed the conversation with Ken today. I have, and uh, there's a lot to be learned, a great deal to be learned uh, looking in new places. And Ken, uh, where, what are you doing now, by the way? Uh, what's the next thing you're looking at? Well, the ritual that the uh, Essenes do on pa uh, uh, Pentecost uh, is extremely important for this and, and that understanding the prophecies and the festivals. So I'm working on a translation of that ritual and seeing where that takes us. Very good. Ken Johnson, just uh, keep watching, folks. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter or follow us at facebook.com slash prophecywatchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.